Hi, I'm Semben Yaakov. This presentation is entitled Bridgeless Active Power Factor Correction. The reason for the need for active power factor correction can be seen here. If we use just a simple bridge rectifier with a capacitor filter in order to connect some equipment to the AC line, what we're going to see is that the current of the line would be sort of picky like this. The reason is that as the capacitor is charged, current will flow only when the AC line is above the value of the capacitor voltage. Consequently, there is no current until we reach a level which is higher than the capacitor voltage. Now this peaky current has of course a very heavy harmonic content shown here, which is now forbidden in, as a matter of fact by a number of standards uh, in most of the countries. And therefore there is a need to shape the input current such that the harmonic content will abide with the norm. Now this is the classical power factor correction circuit. We have a bridge rectifier rectifying the AC voltage to produce a DC pulsating voltage. This is the boost stage with the inductor, switcher, and an output diode. It's an output section, it's a filter capacitor. This actually represents the load. And then there is a feedback from the output which is compared here by this error amplifier. This is to stabilize the output. And then we have a reference actually coming from here. Here we have a sort of a positive waveform, but has a sinusoidal wave shape. So this is used actually as a reference, which is then multiplied by the error signal to produce the uh, signal fed to this feedback loop here which on one hand measures the current and then has this reference. So this arrangement actually produces PWM pulses such that the current here will follow this waveform. And if the voltage is too low or too high, then the uh, amplitude of this waveform will change and consequently we are going to uh, change the PWM such that the current will again follow uh, the waveform, the sinusoidal waveform. And then of course, beyond the bridge rectifier, we're going to see a, a bipolar uh, current plus minus due to the action uh, of the rectifier. So this is the classical power factor correction circuit. Now, what are the losses which are involved here? We have first of all losses associated with the bridge rectifier. There is a voltage drop, so there are some uh, conduction losses. We are going to talk about it in detail later on. There is conduction losses due to the RAC, so-called of the inductor, magnetic losses. There's then losses associated with the output diode. Actually, there are two types of losses associated here. One is conduction losses, and then there is a the reverse recovery effect which does not cause losses that much on the diode, but really impose the losses on the switcher. And we'll talk about it later on. And then we have, of course, the, it'll be a MOSFET uh, with an RDS on, so we have conduction losses. We have switching losses due to the finite rise time. And then we have these losses as caused by, in fact, by this diode. So these are the, Losses, you can add to it uh, ESR uh, of the capacitor. There is some loss here, which is really uh, small compared to the other losses. So let's talk a little bit about diode conduction losses. And let's start with a case in which we have a DC, we have a diode, and then we have a load. And there is a current flowing here. Now the input power is V in times I. This is the DC. And the loss will be I times the voltage of the diode. I'm assuming now that the diode sort of represents a voltage, a constant or a fixed voltage drop. Now diodes have this type of a characteristic, the relationship between the current and the voltage, and really it depends on the type of the diode. Slow diodes, which are 
compatible with the requirement of a line rectification uh, have a relatively low breakdown voltage, so the average could be one volt. In fact, it'll be a little bit less than that. I'm just taking the upper limit. And a fast diode, uh, which will be at the high frequency side, uh, will have sort of an average of a 1.5. So I'm assuming that the voltage drop on the diode is sort of constant, and therefore I have to take into account the DC current and this is the DC current. So what I'm finding here is that the ratio between the loss and the input power is equal to the ratio between the voltage drop on the diode while conducting and the input voltage. Now what happens if the input is sinusoidal, like I'm finding it here, and let's talk about like half of a period of a cycle, uh, the positive one, so there's a current flowing here. Now the input will be IRMS times VRMS, and again the loss, since I'm assuming a DC voltage on the diode, will be the average times the voltage of the diode. Now the average is I peak times 2 over pi, RMS is I peak square root over square root of 2, and therefore I find that the ratio between the loss of the dial and the input power, this is the input from here, is approximately, uh, actually it's 0.9 VD over VRMS. Let's just approximate it to one. So it's again VD over VRMS. This is the voltage of the dial over VRMS. Aside from the conduction losses, we do have losses which are associated with the switching. And I am now uh, talking about the losses due to the reverse recovery of the diode. So this is the boost converter. This is the inductor, the main inductor. This is the diode. And I'm showing here a stray inductance, which will always persist. There's some here, there's some here, there's some here, all over the places. So now I'm assuming that there was a current flowing through the inductor, through the diode. This is true during the off time of the transistor. And then we turn on the transistor. As we turn it on, of course, the current will start building up here uh, and it'll at the same time reduce the current of the diode. So if I look at the diode current, I see here this is the diode current. I see the forward current. This is when the diode is carrying the inductor current. And then as this transistor is turned on, the current starts to flow this way, and therefore the current of the diode is reducing and the slope is dependent on this uh, stray inductance. And eventually it will hit zero, but then it will not stop because the diode will conduct actually both ways until all the charge carriers are swept out of the junction. So for a while, this diode is conducting this way. At this time, the charge carrier are actually moving out of the junction. So eventually it'll taper off and the current of the diode would be zero. Now during this time when there is a current flowing here, there is a charge here and this charge actually causes a loss because what it means is that there is a current, a current flowing this way, which is sort of lost um, to heat as a matter of fact. So the loss associated with this QRR, this is the total charge of the reverse recovery, is the QRR, this area times the switching frequency, and this is actually average current, times V out, and therefore the loss over P in is this ratio of QRR FS V out over P in. So the loss is really a function of frequency. The higher the frequency, the the higher the frequency, the higher we read the loss proportional to the frequency because the number of energy quanta loss per cycle is, of course, uh, going up. So we have it a function of frequency. Also, one should know that this QRR is, as a matter of fact, a function of the forward current. Depending on the forward current, uh, you'll have a QRR, and this is a information that is usually given or should be given at the data sheet of the manufacturer of the diode. 
Looking back at the classical power factor correction circuit, the active power factor correction circuit, we understand now that there are losses associated with the bridge. Actually, we have current flowing through two diodes here, both for the positive and of course the negative half cycle. And then we have the diode here at the output, uh, which is of course causing conduction losses plus this uh, QRR we just talked about. For a line of say between uh, 120 and 230 volt AC, the loss then can be estimated to be, uh, this will be, let's see the line side, this will be two volts over 115 or two volts over 230. So we are talking about between two and approximately one, one to two percent of the total power. Okay, at high, at, high, at high efficiency, P in and P out is about the same. So we're talking about between one and 2% loss. Now, in the case of the output diode, we have one and a half volt, but in a power factor correction circuit, active power factor correction circuit, the output voltage is normally around 400 volt. So we're talking about 1.5 over uh, 400 which is only 0.3 percent that's not that much so now the quest is to reduce these losses even further this is the objective of the bridgeless power factor correction let me just say before going into the bridgeless structure that the losses associated with the power stage and they are really independent on the control here i'm showing a a different type of PFC controller in which there's no sensing of the input voltage, there's only sensing of the current, could be here or could be here, and the output voltage. And again, although the controller is different, the losses are just about the same or they are the same because the power stage is the same and there is a bridge, there is an output diode. So how can we eliminate some of these losses? One approach is the one shown here in which this is a bipolar boost converter that is because we have here two switches uh, in series actually there will be two mosfets in this case this boost works the same way for either the positive half cycle or the negative half cycle so this circuit can be used to produce or force the required sinusoidal current through the inductor that is through the input since we are getting here plus and minus voltages there is a bridge here that will feed to the output only positive uh, pulses so in the positive case in the positive half cycle these diodes will conduct let's see it here uh, here we have the stage on of this bipolar switch and then off uh, it'll go this way and if of course we are in the negative half cycle the current will flow this way and therefore the output will see again positive pulse but through the second pair of diodes so this circuit actually does the work now the what are the advantages here is that uh, we don't have a bridge rectifier at the input at all. So there are no losses associated with the bridge rectifier. However, we do have two diodes conducting rather than one diode in the regular boost converter. So it's a total of say three volt. So as according to the calculation I did earlier, it'll be like 0.6%. So this is sort of solving the problem but it has not been adopted because it has many issues and one of them is the EMI problem. Now, if you have a circuit like that, the point here, as referred to the neutral, is very noisy because there are pulses, very high pulses. And these pulses now are fed to this part and this part now is floating. It's not connected to the neutral. So consequently, what happens is that this, this noise can propagate through this stage and then through the parasitic capacitance between the output stage 
n ground and then be fed back through the not neutral here. Now this is so-called a common mode EMI uh, noise, that is electromagnetic interference, which is then very difficult uh, to filter out. So this uh, circuit has not become that popular because of this reason, and there are actually other reasons for that. Um, the drive is complex because you have two transistors sort of floating here. Uh, you have to drive them at high frequency. We have still two fast diodes here, and of course we'll have the reverse recovery problem. And then uh, we have the EMI, this common mode problem. So uh, this was suggested in the literature and some publication, but it really not been adopted. A circuit that has been adopted for a while is the circuit shown here. Again, we notice that it's different than the regular bridge rectifier. We have here two diodes, two inductors, two transistors, and two high frequency diodes. So basically we have a boost converter, and then we have a boost converter, and as it turns out, each one of these operates at one of the a half cycles of the main. This is this one in the positive and this one in the negative. So let's see really what happens in the uh, say positive half cycle. In this case, say this transistor is turned on and so therefore the inductor is shorted here through this diode to the mains. So this should be the on time of the boost converter. And then during the off time, uh, this current flows through the high frequency diode to the load, and then of course back through this same diode uh, to the main. Now, the other transistor at that time can be actually operated at the same time. It doesn't interfere because the point here is a voltage drop on the diode. So when turning on and off this transistor, really it sees very low voltage. In fact, some of the current will probably uh, actually pass through this transistor. So the nice thing is that you can turn these two together and they are all referred to ground. Now, another point which is very, very important is that at all time, both as a positive half cycle, negative half cycle, these low frequency diodes are actually connecting the neutral to the ground cell of the output. And therefore this EMI issue is really lessened here and it's, it's a much better circuit as far as the EMI, the common mode EMI is concerned. In the negative half cycle, of course, we are going to have a plus here. So therefore this diode will be conducting and this operation is very similar. And then you'll have again the uh, power going out to the output. So this circuit really has uh, advantages over the first circuit that I've shown. And these are that the drive is simple. It has only one slow diode at the input. This is one diode rather than the two diodes. It has reduced uh, EMI due to the fact that, again, the neutral and the ground are actually all the time connected through one of the diode. However, it has two inductors, although, of course, they are carrying half of the current, so they could be smaller. And the same thing goes for the transistor. They, on the average, the current is half of the total current. But still, there are two transistors, two inductors, uh, there's one slow diode. And we still have the problem, of course, the reverse recovery uh, of this uh, high frequency or fast diodes at the output. Another approach, which is getting to be more popular, although what I'm showing first is a simple or a less advanced uh, version, will be this so-called totem pole. Now, totem pole, as we know, this is this Indian pole with these figures here. And the name comes from the fact that you have two transistors, one above the other. Okay, so it's a code or totem pole configuration. So we have two transistors, and in this case, I'm showing two diodes. And I'm showing here two MOSFETs. 
These are silicon MOSFET transistors. Now, again, one can see very clearly we are talking about a boost converter. And say for the positive half cycle, uh, current will flow this way. Now we have the boost, but this is a synchronous boost. That is, here, I'm showing it here. I'm sorry, this diode is reversed. It should be uh, this way. This one is reversed. So we have here a synchronous boost. That is, we don't have a transistor, a switcher, plus a diode, but rather we have a transistor and then another transistor, which will switch when alternatively when this lower one is off. This is we have one transistor is on and then the other one is on. Of course, we have to have a dead time, otherwise there will be a short here. So there is a dead time, but uh, we have now this transistor and this. So we don't have a diode and therefore we don't have a, a voltage drop of a diode, but rather we have a conduction loss of a transistor that is RDS on. And this is what we uh, have in this um, cascode type or totem pole or synchronous boost converter. So what we're going to have here is the diode is correct. Uh, on the positive half cycle of the mains, we have the circuit going this way. And then on the negative half cycle, when this is like this, here, it was plus and minus here, it is reversed. So this diode is conducting. And again, we have uh, this boost converter with this synchronous uh, operation. So basically we're talking about the same boost converter, except the fact that rather than having a diode, we have a transistor. Now these diodes are steering diodes and they uh, would conduct during the half cycle, the positive and negative half cycle of the uh, mains. These are low frequency diodes or, or slow diodes could be. So therefore we have only one diode here. And then we don't have a diode at the output, at the output of this thing, although we have, of course, RDS on, depending on the uh, residual resistance during the on time of the transistor, uh, we'll have some uh, conduction losses of the transistor. Now the situation here, however, is not that simple as it looks. It turns out that with MOSFET transistors, which have an inherent diode, okay, each MOSFET transistor has a diode built in into the structure. These diodes, it turns out, are relatively slow diodes. I'm not showing it here. So I'm now going to examine the situation with this uh, bridgeless totem pole using silicon MOSFET transistors, which, as we've said, have diodes, inherent diodes, plus output capacitance between the drain and the source. This is building, this is a part of the structure of the silicon MOSFET transistor. Now, I'm assuming that current was flowing through this transistor, and now it's time to turn on this one. Now, obviously, we're going to have that time here because we don't want a short here. And during this time, this current now is passing through this diode. So we have actually a diode conducting and this current carrying this current. Now we turn on at this point, we turn on the lower transistor and the current in this lower transistor starts to turn on and the current through this upper transistor, which is in fact through the uh, diode is going down the same rate um, because the sum of them, of course, is the inductor current. So this current will go down, but, but eventually all the current of the inductor is going through this transistor, and then we'll have this extra reverse current flowing through this diode, reverse recovery of this diode, 
through this transistor and I'm showing it here. Here's this extra current that this transistor C sees due to this current flowing here. So we have it here. And once this current stops due to the fact that the charge carriers are swept out of the junction, then the voltage at this point will start dropping. It should be emphasized that the voltage drop on a diode while it's conducting both in the forward or reverse direction is the same, about the same. So until there is no reverse current, the voltage here is in fact the output voltage. So at this point, this voltage starts to drop. Here it is. But we still have some more current flowing through these capacitor. This capacitor is now charged to the uh, full output voltage. And this capacitor is now being charged from zero, while this transistor was conducting, to this upper, to this full voltage. So we have these current going into this transistor. And of course, this is causing extra power loss. And then the voltage will drop here to ground. Okay, it'll drop to ground. Aside from the fact that uh, we have this extra current, we do have some finite rise time of the current of IS2. And therefore, we're going to have some overlap between the voltage across VD2, this is the voltage across this transistor, and the current flowing through it. And this product is actually a power loss of this transistor, heating up the transistor. So we have a power loss, which is increased due to the fact that we have the extra current of the reverse recovery. And also we have this current from this capacitor, which now the energy of this capacitor is actually dumped into the transistor. And of course is causing this transistor to heat up. So these are the losses associated with this particular configuration of the totem pole. And therefore, uh, the advantage of this uh, configuration is not that high, although there's no bridge, input bridge, and uh, there is no high frequency diode, although there is a transistor with RDS on. But considering the fact that we have all these uh, problems of uh, reverse recovery, etc., etc., and, and capacitance, uh, then of course the advantage uh, that you get is not that high as compared to uh, what is already available. So let's have a look at the losses associated here. Now we talked about the loss due to the reverse current QRR, but now I've introduced this loss due to the fact that this capacitor, which stored energy, has this energy is dumped into the transistor. Now the amount of charge is V out over uh, the capacitance, and the loss is this energy, which is transferred from the capacitor into the RDSON, in fact, of the transistor. And of course, this is energy times frequency. This will be the uh, loss, the power loss. Now, adding to it the loss due to the QRR, then we have here an expression for the total loss of both QR, QRR and the output capacitance of this transistor, both of which are a function of frequency. The higher the frequency, the higher the loss. So you are limited not to work at high frequency because uh, the penalty is pretty high. So this is why there is a trend now to move toward different types of transistor away from the silicon to the gallium nitride, gallium nitride transistor. Now this transistor, uh, of course, using different material, and the characteristic of this material, as far as the functions that we are concerned here, are really much better than those of the silicon MOSFET. So let's have a look here. 
Now the reverse recovery uh, of silicon, and this is, I'm talking about the diode of a MOSFET of say 650 volt at about 20 amp device for high power at two, three kilowatts. Uh, the reverse recovery will be like uh, something like 150 nanoseconds. And in the case of gallium nitride, there's no reverse recovery. The behavior is like a capacitance and it's fairly low value, like two picofarad. So it's really remarkable because the losses associated with, there's actually no losses associated with QRR because there's no reverse uh, current. Now also the output capacitance uh, of the, the drain to source in the silicon would be like for this particular device would be like 150 and in the case of gallium nitride it would be half of it. Also, which is very important, the gate charge, that is the charge that you need in order to turn on the device, in the case of a silicon would be like 167 nanocoulomb because it's a big transistor, while here it's only 5.8. This means that you can drive it much, much faster and go to much higher frequencies. And also the rise time of the device, while here it'll be like 18 nanoseconds, here it'll be 3.7 nanoseconds. Again, it's quite a bit faster. So we are talking about a faster device that uh, can be operated at high frequency and had lower losses. So this is why uh, this configuration is really preferred. The operation will be similar to what I have said, except for the fact that we are not going to have this reverse recovery problem of the diode associated with the uh, silicon MOSFET. In order to even further improve the operation and to lower the losses, there is a way to replace the two diodes with two transistors. These could be uh, regular silicon MOSFET transistors, and they operate uh, at a low frequency, at the line frequency, just replacing the diode. That is, whenever this diode uh, would have conducted, this transistor is turned on, and therefore the voltage drop here will be dependent on the RDS on and not the voltage across the, the diode. And the same thing goes here for the negative half cycle. So this is very similar to what we have seen before. And um, therefore, this would be now preferred over the uh, configuration with the two diodes because it's doing the same thing and certainly over the uh, silicon MOSFET and uh, you have minimum of losses in this circuit. Again, due to the fact that you have one transistor conducting or the other transistor conducting, then you are actually connecting the neutral to the power line. From AC point of view, this and this are actually the same. So therefore, the EMI issue is again lower than uh, in the configuration I've shown earlier. There are some problems here. The drive is complex because there is an upper transistor you have to turn on. Not to mention the fact that uh, driving a uh, gallium nitride uh, transistor is not that simple. It's very sensitive, but none. there are, of course, uh, dedicated drivers for, the, for these transistors. Now, there is the problem of current sensing because uh, depending where the control ground, say if this, this is the control ground, then you have to sense the current here, which is floating in order to get the control that you need for the power factor correction. Also, there is a problem of the voltage sensing if you are using uh, the conventional control of active power factor correction. There's also an issue which I'm not going into. It turns out that during the crossover of the low frequency uh, waveform, that is when it goes from say positive to negative and vice versa, there is a EMI issue and you have to do some uh, actually soft start in order to uh, lower the EMI emission uh, at this crossover instant. And also it turns out that although the losses are lower, this is 
this particular configuration does not lead to a significant size reduction. That is, although the losses are lower, you'd like also the size to be smaller. This is the demand of the day. And as it turns out uh, that you are not gaining much as compared to the uh, conventional power factor correction. And of course, we still have losses associated with the rise time of the transistor as fast as it'll go, because you'd like to go to higher frequency. So um, uh, the rise time still will cause losses. And of course, the output capacitance of this transistor, although it's lower, the capacitance is lower than the silicon MOSFET, but still there is an output capacitance, and there's an energy uh, associated with it. And as you go to a higher frequency, of course, these losses will come significant. So what can be done to improve even further the efficiency and to reduce, that is, to reduce the losses? Well, one thing that can be done is to use the so-called soft switching. In this soft switching scheme, what is done is to lower the voltage of a transistor, say this transistor, before you turn it on. So the overlap between the voltage of the transistor and the current is minimized. In here, it's almost zero. So there will be no loss associated with the right time, the rise time, and also with the output capacitance, because the, cap the uh, capacitance is being discharged by a sort of an external circuit, which is lost. So how can we achieve something like that? This can be done by changing the mode of operation, rather than operating in CCM, that is continuous current mode, in which the inductor current here, shown here for say half cycle of the main, has some ripple on it, but it's positive all the time. We move to this called borderline or critical mode operation, in which we have sort of triangular waveforms, which are actually penetrating here and moving into the negative current area. So we have positive, large positive, and then some negative current here. As I'll show later on, uh, this will bring about or can bring about zero voltage switching. Of course, uh, we are going to have a higher RMS current because the RMS of this uh, waveform is much higher than the RMS of this waveform due to the uh, higher peaks. But still, if indeed we can reduce the switching losses by this uh, negative current, uh, the total gain is much higher than the uh, loss due to the higher RMS. And this approach really has uh, many advantages to it. So let's see what really happens if indeed we operate in this critical mode. So I'm showing here again the situation in which we have a current flowing through the upper transistor. I'm keeping this transistor on until the current will go down and down and down and in fact reach zero. Remember that the voltage and the output of a boost converter is higher than the input voltage. So therefore, if you keep this transistor on, current that will flow here actually has now uh, a voltage which is in the reverse direction. So the current will become lower and lower, and eventually it will uh, change its direction because this side is, has a higher voltage than this side. So here we see the current of this transistor going down, 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 and in fact hitting zero, okay? And now we are letting it to continue. So it becomes even negative, okay? Here it is becoming negative. So we have a current here becoming negative. So at this point, I'm turning off S1. And after a while, I am turning on S2. Now, during this time, when I've turned off 
S1, there's no current through this transistor, and the current now will flow through these parasitic capacitances this way. And in fact, lower start lowering the voltage here because we are pulling current here and you might say discharging this capacitor and charging this capacitor so the voltage here starts dropping due to this current of these capacitors okay eventually this transistor will conduct as it turns out similar to a silicon mosfet when you have a negative current through a gallium nitride uh, transistor it will conduct so this transistor will conduct so now we can turn on s2 and as we turn on s2 of course the current will become more positive and eventually we'll have a positive current like the on time of a regular boost converter so what really happened here is that the voltage across transistor s2 was lowered here before we turned it on so we have an area here of zero voltage switching there's no overlap between the voltage and the current of this lower transistor so this is really a advantage of this topology and consequently we can get very high efficiency we can operate at high frequency there are no diodes involved there's no input diode there's no bridge and there's no output diode and the losses depend on the rds of these transistors uh, the power density could be high because we can go to very high frequency i'll show you in a minute and there is a reduced emi because as i've said these two transistors uh, connect actually the neutral to the ground or to the positive rail which is for ac like ground and therefore the common mode issue is lessened here now the problem is that uh, we are using a gallium nitride that's a new technology and these transistors are fairly expensive the gate is gate drive is really complex but there are already uh, dedicated drivers for the gate drive uh, current sensing again this is because of the topology I has not included gallium nitride or the uh, critical mode but in this topology current sensing is complex uh, also the input voltage sensing is complex control is therefore not simple uh, for this circuit and uh, in fact uh, it has been shown that uh, digital control uh, simplifies matter quite a bit here because you really have to do many decisions of turning on these and there's a the crossover um, problem etc etc so control is uh, complex and then as I've said there is a zero crossover problem that you have to do sort of a soft start whenever there's a zero crossing here and therefore already the control is complex but then if you have a, a dedicated controller like a digital controller then of course everything boils down to the uh, program that you write into this controller so here are some actual measurements and results uh, these were shown in a paper recently published uh, at the or presented at the IEEE Applied Power Electronic Conference and Exhibition APEC uh, 2017 and uh, this is a breedless totem pole a gallium nitride the synchronous rectifier and a borderline or critical mode and with zero voltage switching this is the configuration or the method that I've just shown in the previous slides and what we see here are two things number one is the efficiency uh, this is a 1.5 kilowatt unit and as you can see we're talking about starting from 700 watt uh, something like 99 percent that's very very impressive of course and 
this method of zero voltage switching with the uh, borderline or critical mode operation uh, results in a non-constant fre switching frequency. And what they are showing here is the range of frequencies that you are expected to see. This is the frequency here. So it goes up to 1.5 megahertz. And depending on the load, like for 100% load, uh, this will be the frequency. This is now the a period or half the period of the main uh, waveform. So this will be like uh, from zero to 180 degrees. So you see that you go through a, a maximum of one megahertz, then go down, then go to a, another uh, peak here. And in the case of very, very, very light load, like 5%, um, you go to fairly high frequency. In fact, uh, in this case, you have to go into burst mode. Uh, I'm not talking about it in this uh, presentation, which means that you have to turn on and off uh, the control uh, in order to improve the uh, wave, uh, waveform, the shape of the waveform. So these are actual experimental results uh, of a system that can be uh, achieved. So this brings me to the end of this uh, presentation. I thank you very much for your attention. I hope that you found it interesting and that it will be useful to you in the future. Thank you.